Welcome to the National Rural Health Executive Webinar Series. My name is Colleen Bay with NRHA Services Corps. I have just a couple of housekeeping notes to review before we get started. Everyone will be muted. We're going to try to get through the webinar in about 30 to 40 minutes, offering some time at the very end for questions. If you have a question for either one of the presenters, uh, go ahead and just type it into your GoTo webinar control panel, and I'll make sure that it gets covered at the very end. And as a reminder, today's event is being recorded and you'll get an email before the end of the day with a link to the recording. Today, we have two presenters, uh, Lindsay Corkin and Keith Bublow. Lindsay is an accomplished consultant and practice management professional with over 10 years of healthcare and medical office experience. At Stroudwater Associates, Lindsay focuses on supporting and sustaining healthcare access for rural communities through hospital operational improvement and affiliation strategies and has assisted rural and community hospitals and clinics across the country to improve operational and financial performance. Results oriented and highly organized, Lindsay is a skilled and effective communicator with medical providers, patients, and administration. Keith Bublo joined Stroudwater Associates over 20 years ago and has helped develop Stroudwater's data-driven approach to client engagements. He has expertise in the management, analysis, and presentation of healthcare data to assist in strategic planning and uses of state-of-the-art geographic information systems data and data visualization software. He has developed innovative approaches to studying a healthcare organization standing and uses multiple public and private data sources to define and develop hospital markets. A major focus of his work is helping decision makers see meaning in their operational data by using emerging information, visualization tools, and techniques. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our partner, Stroudwater Associates. Stroudwater is a healthcare advisory firm focused on improving strategic operational and financial capability for rural and community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. As a platinum partner, Stroudwater is a huge supporter of NRHA's efforts on Capitol Hill and contribute valuable education resources to our rural hospitals and clinics. At this time, I'm now going to turn it over to Lindsay for our feature presentation, Understanding Your Market Through a Health Equity Lens. Lindsay? Thanks, Colleen, and, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Keith, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Uh, today, uh, we're really going to talk about a couple things today um, and, and really taking, you know, health equity, such a large topic to tackle and to start to talk about so many kind of moving parts. But really, um, we want to understand what the importance, why are we talking about health, health equity and social determinants of health really related to the data, the 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 numbers, the um, the the level of uh, what we're going to use for getting a better understanding about our communities. Um, we're going to understand what some of the the data tells us about uh, health disparities, whether that's at the state level, the local level, um, things that might be meaningful for your um, organization. And then, really, how do we appreciate this data to support a health equity strategy? Something that is very relevant and folks are talking about today. Um, and recognizing what what you can have, uh, what your role can be, or your circle of influence uh, related to health equity, and and leveraging that that data related to health equity. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why why looking at health data, uh, health equity data, and why that matters? Um, you know, unless it's specifically measured, um, we're going to see disparities in health and health care really go unnoticed. Um, and so taking a look at, at the data and, and asking the question, you know, why is this happening? And really kind of looking at it and starting to look at stratifying that healthcare data by different elements, you know, uh, around race, ethnicity, language, and other different demographic factors. It's really important to really understand um, and start to start to address and have the conversations around health disparities, um, you know, locally and with our, when, within our own communities. And healthcare organizations have, you know, often kind of underestimated the magnitude of those disparities. You know, uh, maybe you know that there is part of your community that, um, you know, can uh, does not have great healthcare access. Um, but, you know, there may be a bigger, bigger problem. Um, there may be other subsets of your community that um, unless measured and, and unless um, explored and data is gathered and data is looked at, um, those, those disparities go unnoticed. Um, and so we want to understand, you know, leveraging this data, 
um, what, you know, what's the magnitude of the disparity and having in developing the strategy on really and allocating, an, you know, necessary resources to be able to start to minimize that and to really kind of help solve um, that those disparities. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> A little delay. Um, but really, you know, let's let's do some level setting. You know, at, you know, what's the difference between um, equality and equity? You know, health equity really refers, and you may have seen this, you know, image in the slide, and I think it just portrays what health equity is. Really refers to the individuals achieving their highest level of health through the elimination of disparities in health and healthcare. Um, you know, the Healthy People 2020 really defines health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Um, you know, the CDC defines it as uh, the achievement of health equity is when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, um, and that no one is disadvantaged from achieving that potential. Uh, so, you know, certainly there, you know, the focus is really creating those, that, that equity around health. Next slide, please. And so what is health inequity? You know, health inequities are really the, the unjust differences in, in health status. And, and it's due to, you know, discrimination, exclusion of certain, you know, groups of people, uh, lack of power and financial mobility. And all of this can have an impact, you know, um, related to kind of their, un, you know, basic needs are not being met. And those basic needs such as, you know, food and housing um, are really affected and can be affected by uh, educational attainment or even, you know, race and ethnicity, health literacy and income level all have, you know, a, um, a impact on one's ability to, uh, you know, attain that health, health equity. Next slide, please. And we know that there, you know, being rural organizations and in, 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 in rural healthcare, there are certain health disparities that just because you are, are, are in rural and um, live in rural America, you are at a uh, disadvantage or a there is a disparity between our urban counterparts. Um, one being around the life expect expectancy, excuse me, um, you know, a recent study came out that, you know, the five leading causes of death around heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, chronic um, uh, lower respiratory disease and stroke uh, was much higher around uh, uh, rural residents. Rural communities had higher rates of death compared to uh, the urban populations. And there's also higher rates of potentially Ac, um, excess deaths in rural communities. And so the CDC looks at those as those are the have been prevented if there was improved public health programs, uh, public health programs that supported healthier behaviors or better access to healthcare services. So there's a whole category on related deaths that ha has correlation to, you know, supporting uh, public health and supporting health equity. Um, and but you know, rural represents really a challenge related to understanding the underlying causes of poor health and death. Um, experts have noted that you know there is ac uh, poor access to data related to rural healthcare, um, and so this you know really kind of highlights the importance of of how we obtain data in our rural communities, um, and and really will hopefully improve and start to improve on you know the outcomes of related to the data on rural health. Uh, next slide, please. And I always, you, you may have seen this, this, this graphic has been around for quite a while, but it really um, kind of hones in on what contributes to great health outcomes. Um, and it really starts at the bottom. You know, there is uh, policies and programs um, are, are, you know, your social determinants of health are influenced by the policies and programs that are developed and that all trickles up to whether or not there are better health outcomes and those are achieved. Um, one thing to note, you know, if you see here that clinical care only comprises of 20% of what shapes health outcomes. The other 80% is really tied to behaviors and environments. So the social, economical, economic and physical factors um, are, are all kind of, you know, the more important, the, the, the bigger piece of the pie 
as it relates to to health outcomes. And so, you know, uh, lots of um, influence on related to health outside of a hospital, a doctor's office um, that contribute to one's health outcome, uh, quality of life, and 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 life expectancy. Next slide, please. And so, want to make sure that we kind of look at, you know, what are social determinants of health. Um, and, you know, we, it, as an important aspect to addressing and contributing to health equity is, or is, is around social determinants of health. And it's really a primary approach to achieving health equity. So, you know, um, according to Healthy People 2030, um, social determinants of health are the conditions and environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age um, that really affect a wide range of health and quality of life outcomes and risks. And you can see certainly, um, we'll talk a little bit more about social determinants of health, but ranging from you know, the, the neighborhood and physical environment that one grows up in, the education that they receive, um, what is their community like, or, or um, their access to, to healthy foods, you know, all, all are contributing factors um, related to health outcomes and well-being. Next slide. And a newer um, term that has, has been coming up is around health-related social needs. Um, so similar to social determinants of health, um, the health-related social needs are more um, the, the cause of poor health outcome for an individual patient, as opposed to the social determinants of health looks at more about describing what's going on related to a population. Um, and so when we look at health related social needs, it's really more individualized and, and individualized to that to that patient. Um, and so this help starts to help us create, you know, in answers, you know, what are we going to, how can we help um, and support individual patients um, related to these health related social needs. So, you know, if if you are in the clinical space and you have a patient and you're developing, you know, a care plan. Um, for a diabetic patient, uh, you know, that might be, you know, you'd have to consider, you know, maybe they are food insecure and the plan of care that we've developed might not meet their needs because they don't have access to, to those, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and, you know, they, so it's going to be a little bit different. So we need to start to take into consideration some of those individualized um, health related social needs. Or for an example, you know, a patient is referred for radiation therapy, outpatient radiation therapy, but there's a lack of uh, tr transportation to have an impact on that patient's health outcome if transportation is an issue to get to the necessary treatment. Uh, so consideration that that personal individual level. And next slide, please. And as we've, you've likely heard, you know, um, CMS just recently with um, some the, the new um, uh, OPPS rulings, and one of them is around uh, some uh, health equity related quality measures. And one being around the hospital's commitment to a health equity measure, a new measure, quality measure. And, you know, and it is, you know, right where we want to go. This is, um, but again, it's looking at five uh, key domains around an organization's, a hospital organization's commitment to health equity, um, and really around building a strategic plan around health equity, data collection and data analysis, quality improvement, and leadership engagement. You know, those four domain, domain, domains of um, achieving, you know, a plan related to health equity and how you will, you know, play a role in supporting your community. Um, and then there's some additional measures around uh, screening and identifying patient level health related and social needs. And, you know, what are we doing in terms of, you know, what patient presents to our organization, our hospital? You know, uh, do we have the necessary foundational elements to be screening and collecting again, back to that patient level, individual health related social needs um, information. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then similar to the, uh, you know, CMS, uh, a, a joint commission has also have has requirements uh, to reduce healthcare disparities. And, you know, uh, really around, again, similar to what CMS has put out there as new required measurements um, is, is around uh, the developing a strategy. Um, and the elements of performance, if you are a joint commissioned uh, organization, this is something that is um, inclusive of critical access hospitals, you know, is and having to meet these elements of performance is around developing the strategy, you know, screening for those health related social needs, um, having a, a written act, action plan, uh, stratifying data, um, collecting data um, and stratifying that, that data, um, acting on the information that is received. You know, what is, do we have an action plan based on the data that we've just, um, you know, uh, to, to really identify disparities in our patient population, and, and is there an action plan um, on, on how we're going to maybe reduce some of those health disparities, and involving key stakeholders. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about um, the involvement of, of others in, in tackling, you know, um, in support in reducing some of those healthcare disparities. Next slide, please. So now, um, next slide, please. We really want to talk about, so why, you know, why within the CMS um, uh, quality measures and, you know, the Joint Commission, why does data um, come up so much? And why is it important for us to be looking at healthcare data as it relates to health equity? And, you know, it's certainly, it is um, understanding kind of health disparities supports the triple aim, you know, the triple aim, of the triple aim being around improving the patient experience of care, improving the health of our population, and in and, and um, reducing the whole cost of care as well. Um, and in addition to that, you know, there are we can start to identify health disparities by qu querying those those data sets, asking those questions, um, stratifying those data sets. You know, looking at, you know, we have, um, you know, data related to our, our patient population within our hospital. Um, maybe we want to look at the Hispanic population um, and querying uh, folks that are um, have heart disease. Um, and what is that magnitude of that, that patient population? Or what about the folks that may um, have, have indicated that their, their highest level of education is high school? education and they've attained um, and where you know they're needing um, they have diabetes so they may need additional support um, around diabetes management for instance um, and another thing is you know mapping or visualizing the data um, looking at not just a flat file of a whole bunch of numbers when you take it to the next level and start to map and visualize, that data, it's rep it, it almost is represented a little bit differently. It, it tells a story. You can understand maybe where there are some of those gaps. Maybe if you're mapping it, you can maybe see geographically there is a neighborhood or there is a community within our service area that may have that higher prevalence of a certain disease. And we can start to figure out where those populations exist um, or maybe where that population um, is located that may be at an, an additional um, risk. But what makes it hard? Um, there are certainly, I mean, on paper, this sounds like, yes, this is the right thing to do, and we're all on board with this, but there's certainly some gaps in resources. You know, at the individual, you know, healthcare organization level, there are, you know, limited technical abilities to be able to pull this information, this data from our own systems. And maybe, you know, when I say map or visualize the data, you know, that is hard to do. Um, and, and even just once it is maybe presented, even deciphering it, what is the next step that we're gonna do with this information and with this data? So um, one thing that we can maybe suggest doing is, is next slide please, Keith. is around um, creating a data collection framework. Because so often, you know, when you think about all the healthcare related data that a hospital or a physician practice has, you know, every single time a patient walks in for an appointment, 
we have them fill out what a demographics sheet we ask them a whole bunch of questions related to their health history um and you know having a systematic you know collect data collection framework will help make um organizations have more complete um and you know data set and because we need to have that complete full data set um, to be able to leverage that and use that information strategically as it relates to health equity. So, you know, the American Hospital Association and their Institute for Diversity and Inclusion um, has, has listed out some various elements for to include in that framework. And, and this really would help uh, organizations, you know, in your internal folks be able to, to you know, communicate with patients about why this information is important. Um, and, you know, we need to, you know, articulate, articulate that to our patient. What is the driving force that we are asking folks for their, you know, their sexual orientation on, um, and then maybe, you know, aiding, aiding staff members with a script. Um, and so we can make sure that, and that staff members are saying, um, what has been, you know, decided from the organization about um, why we're going to, you know, what we're going to do with this information. And, and so having a script certainly will aid staff in that. Um, you know, and again, having, you know, making sure that we're collecting um, this information, having a framework to do so um, will ensure that the data is, is more complete and we, you know, have more to kind of work with to, to really figure out um, more about our patient population in our communities and where there may be some of those health disparities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I always say, you know, utilize the data that you have and then get the data that you want. Um, so, you know, as healthcare organizations, like I mentioned before, every single time a patient comes in, they're giving some type of healthcare um, uh, information. Um, related to to them them individually, and in addition to what we are producing um, internally, you know, from utilization data to referral information, um, it, you know, clinical outcomes, we can start. We're sitting on a whole bunch of data internally, and then we have the opportunity to really go out and get that external data, whether that's you know a state level health information exchange. Um, there are state and federal data sets that are available publicly, claims data, you know, Medicare and CMS has a whole, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of data that's out there related to, you know, a geographic area um, and that you can start to kind of hone in on, on your own service area and community. But, you know, when we get all of this data from the outside sources or internal sources, we start to understand our population a little bit better we can start to identify care gaps or even those health disparities. We can look, start to look at what are some of the risks and stratify those. Um, from a patient care pr perspective and how we close those gaps, we engage our patients um, a little bit better or a little bit different, differently, uh, depending on, on that data and that information. Um, we help you know, support and manage the care based on maybe some of those care gaps that we've identified and we measure outcomes to make sure that we are improving and that we do have an impact. Um, and, but again, going back to leveraging that, that data that's gonna help us understand our patient population better. Next slide, please. And we can also look at how social determinants of health um, uh, related to our patient population and really kind of, at, you know, We've had, you know, ICD-10 has, um, you know, uh, diagnostics codes that will, you know, we can track utilizing these Z codes. Um, and there, there is going to be a lot more, um, you know, oversight and, and utilization and, and organizations in this, again, because this is something that you could pull out of your system and understand, you know, is there a certain population group within our patients that um, has, you know, occupational exposure to risk factors, you know, and maybe they have a higher rate of COPD. And, you know, what is, how can we kind of close that care gap or help further um, have better clinical outcomes for that, for that, that group there. Uh, next slide. So, 
Um, how do we identify and understand where those um, health inequities may be? Uh, we certainly can't um, kind of assume that we know what the health inequities are in our community because they may be different from any national or state data or any other surrounding communities. Um, and so we want to make sure that we utilize the best available data to understand what's going on in our own community. Um, and so we, and, and again, can we gain um, a really a comprehensive understanding of any of those identified health inequities? Um, different, you know, examining multiple aspects of your the health in your community to get a clearer picture. Um, use appropriate tools to identify health inequities. So again, there are national databases. There's the health department data, and and you know, universities and hospitals um, putting in research groups that are put out a lot of um, a, a data, um, and that we can use and, and leverage um, related to health outcomes. And they are, uh, you know, you know, everything is a good starting point. Um, and getting familiar with looking at health-related data is a is a great um, uh, starting point. But it shouldn't be there shouldn't be only just one source of data. Um, and we'll probably we'll we'll go into that a little bit more. But you know, having partnerships with other you know organizations to be able to leverage their you know. Uh, data sets, maybe a police department, maybe the transportation group. Um, they all have some type of uh, data sources. The the local water department, again, things like that and having um, additional data sources outside of what we normally think of when we think of health outcomes or um, clinical outcomes. Um, we want to, you know, leverage additional data sources there. Um, engage those community members in that data collection and interpretation. Uh, again, it goes back to, we're not gonna be able to do this on our own. We can certainly get it started, but engaging others um, to help in whether it's data collection or interpretation will you know, help us identify where those health inequities may be and, and, and start to create some of those solutions together. Um, next slide, please. And certainly when we do have get information health related data we want to be asking the right questions um, we want to ask questions that will give us insight into the social determinants of health of our patients in our hospitals in our communities and so we certainly have two kind of um, queries you know those are the, the the questions that you ask a process query maybe you know we want to look at the percent of um, female patients by race who were screened for breast cancer. You know, that is a, a process um, example there. But an outcome um, example, maybe something that we're, we're looking at is the um, ethnicity breakdown of patients who suffered a fall during an inpatient stay. Want to un understand that from an outcome perspective. Um, or, you know, the breakdown of readmitted patients by insurance status. Again, those are all kind of outcomes. So again, it's asking the data and asking those right questions or asking the questions about, about the data there. Um, Keith, next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Keith and he's gonna walk through some examples um, related to you know, utilizing a data, a data source, pulling it specific to a, a service area or in, and how you can start to maybe map or visualize and what that data may tell you um, about your community. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I do agree with what Lindsay said. I think that the uh, the uh, internal data is going to be your best source. And as the uh, the IQR and the Joint Commission uh, initiatives kind of uh, ramp up, with now that they're backed by by uh, um, uh, you know, kind of the powers that be, I think it's going to be a, a really great resource for organizations to uh, to get that really detailed information and start and start uh, using it. Um, uh, and again, you know, looking at your your current EHR, the surveys that you do, um, your health information exchange in your state. Um, I don't know in, in where we are in Maine, we've got a, a pretty robust HIE that has uh, socioeconomic data. 
um, and then you know uh, risk stratification for each of the population, at least within our Medicaid population. So it's very helpful for for organizations to to access that. Um, and then of course the you know the claims data and then um, um, and, and other sources like that. But I, what I wanted to show was some some examples of some some uh, kind of community data or you know, free sources data that you can look at. Uh, that'll allow you to kind of get a kind of common fact base for the equity that exists, you know, the health inequity that exists in your community now. Um, one of the examples I, that we really like is uh, called the uh, CARES Center for Applied Research and Engagement. Um, it's uh, affiliated with the University of Missouri system. Um, and what they do is they, uh, um, they kind of uh, uh, give you access to a bunch of different data sources, uh, including the, the Census Bureau, the ACS, um, the CDC, USDA, FBI, um, and kind of uh, kind of bring it together in one one format, so you can you can quickly uh, 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 you know, get an idea of what's going on in your in your uh, in your area. Um, they have different data geographies, ranging from a national, state, county, down to the city, census tract, school district, uh, and zip code levels. Um, I'm going to show some examples of the zip code level here, and, and also the county level. Um, the nice thing about this uh, data source is that it's it's pretty timely and reliable. There's you know the different data sources are going to have different vintage, um, but at least with this you know that you're kind of getting the most recent version, um, and it's uh, it's so it's pretty helpful. Um, and it's not you know there's uh, Lindsay talked about some you know uh, restrictions on data that are available now, and it's not completely robust. So there's going to be some gaps. Um, but you just kind of have to work with that. But I think, uh, you know, knowing that you're getting at least the, the most recent data that you can that you can get, um, uh, you know, can give you a, some peace of mind that you're coming coming at this from a common fact base. Um, and some of that data is, is it includes detailed racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic categories. So CARES, for example, has about 650 different indicators. Um, and they're broken out into different categories, including clinical care and prevention, demographics, um, behaviors, outcomes, what the workforce is, going to be housing and family, income and economics, and other social and economic factors, your physical environment. So um, very much in line with the social determinants of health categories that we, we looked at before. Um, so Stradwater, in, uh, in our work, we, we uh, kind of pulled this data internally and then developed a dashboard that allows us to kind of quick through, quickly go through some of the some of the different categories that, as it relates to the work that we're doing. Um, so we, we put together a dashboard. Um, and we compare those uh, those local areas to kind of benchmarks uh, for state and national. Kind of gives us an idea of where the the outliers are for different different uh, uh, elements. Um, and um, what we do is we look at to make it the comparison pretty easy. We look at uh, percentages or, or rates per, per per defined population. So you know we can look at uh, a small population population versus the national and state populations. Um, and if it's possible, we do show the number of values. Um, so, like I said, some of the indicators are zip code level breakdowns, um, and you, in some cases, you can even go down to the Census Bureau. Um, so, first thing we always do is, you know, as Lindsay talked about, you want to define your service area. So, this is generally the service area that you're used to serving, the population that you're used to serving. Um, in our approach, we look at, um, you know, what's the percentage of your patients? Say you get 75% of your patient origin comes from these zip codes, or where you have a certain uh, uh, market share uh, threshold. You know, maybe it's uh, these are the zip codes where you have 10% market share or or, or more, um, and that defines your service area. That's where we always start. And then we can look at different things like population. So in this case, we're just stratifying your population very basically by by uh, age group details and showing where the, the growth is and the changes. Uh, so you kind of have an, uh, an idea of where people are in your in the uh, in your service area and what um, what the changes the population and who the different ages are. Um, and then you can you can stratify them down by that same population down by different races um, and show kind of where um, you know where certain ethnic ethnicities and racial categories are might be uh, uh, collected in your in the different service area that you can uh, focus on. And that's from from that standpoint, you can kind of look into different um, socioeconomic factors such as median household income. So how does your the income the median income in your zip code how does that compare to the state average um, or the state median within uh, for your particular state? Because as we looked at, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that's been clear for for me is that looking at equity is not just you know um, it's 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 not just racial categories, ethnic categories, things like that. It's it comes down to the you know economics, education, 
um, which I think are important. Disability, populations with disability are, are, are important to look at as well. So this is just an example of looking at some of the, the stratified dem demographics within the service area. Um, so um, there's multiple different demographic categories that are included in this particular data set. So we can look at you know, who are our, our population that are black or African American, uh, our population that is foreign born, for example, uh, population that is Hispanic, population with uh, uh, you know, a, a lower, uh, population with a, a geographic uh, mobility uh, issues. Populations with limited English um, uh, uh, um, ability, which you know, would impact their 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 ability to reach out to different uh, healthcare providers. As I said, education is a big factor that can affect health equity, um, and this will show the different um, differences in educational attainment and proficiencies among your population. Uh, so, for example, this is uh, looking at how does your um, your population with no high school diploma compare to uh, the different counties, your service areas in the orange there, the two county service area, how does it compare to the different counties, the states, and then to the national average? This is an ex example of looking at um, access to primary care. So this is looking at the, uh, the uh, uh, element of healthcare workforce. Um, so what is the, uh, the, the, the rate of visit for, uh, primary care physicians, uh, the rate per thousand population within the service area. Uh, so this um, is going to identify, you know, you know, gaps where access might be might be limited uh, because there's simply not enough primary care physicians. This is an example of looking at what is our service area, how does our service area compare uh, in terms of population. So this is the population with a uh, an income below 200% uh, of the federal poverty level. And then, as I said before, some of these data are broken down by uh, more uh, detailed uh, racial and economic, economic, uh, ethnic, economic indicators. Uh, so this is a looking at um, the population in poverty in our service area um, uh, by race. Uh, so in our report area, um, uh, you can see that in this case, the black or African American population um, has a significantly higher uh, rate of, of poverty um, compared to other, other racial categories. And then being able to look at those, those individual um, uh, populations at a zip code level, as Lindsay had talked about, to kind of find you know, different versions of sections of your service area or of your community or neighborhoods uh, you know that might be outliers um, in terms of, of um, economics or educational attainment or different uh, demographic um, uh, factors um, so this is looking at um, you know, poverty population and poverty by race related to that, that previous slide um, and what are the percentages of poverty for um, uh, different uh, racial categories This is an example of looking at uh, clinical care and prevention. So in this case, it's uh, blood pressure medication, um, non-adherence by race or ethnicity. Um, and um, as you can see from the example, uh, in this particular service area, the, the black or African-American population has a much higher percentage of, um, of non-adherence uh, to, um, uh, to both blood pressure management. So this comes to where, where you can you know, focus your attention on, on care coordination for that population. And likewise, this is an example of health outcomes. Uh, so this, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, breast cancer incidence and the rate uh, per thousand population. Uh, this is broken up by race and ethnicity, uh, black versus versus white here. Um, in some cases, the uh, uh, the incidence for uh, uh, certain populations are much higher um, uh, than others. And the data can indicators on the side there, if you can see them. So, you know, there's there's multiple different data indicators that can break out this information by these different categories. So that's just a quick example. Um, I, there's uh, other data sources that are available. There's there's you know health research and statistics statistics that you can you can access um, at the federal level. We talked about the CDC and the U.S. Census. Like I said, the CARES 
Uh, SparkMap uh, uh, version is a, is a very good uh, data source. Um, state level, um, the state departments of public health um, have data available. Um, and at your local level, you have your public health department. And then there are some examples that we talked about before. Um, some of these are, are free sources. Um, so the Spark Map is free. The ACS, uh, American Community Survey is free. The census is, is free. Um, and then there are some versions of, of the data that you can, uh, that you, you can pay for. Um, uh, some of the examples of that might be, uh, um, for example, we use Meritive, which is uh, IBM Watson. So it's detailed demographic information. Uh, Claritas has some information that's available as well. That's it. I'm going to pass it over to Lindsay now. Great, thanks. So really to kind of put a capstone on everything that we just talked about is really help uh, understanding how this all fits into our overall strategy. Um, you know, and as, as you've seen from the, the new uh, health equity quality measures from CMS, as well as, you know, uh, some length, some elements of performance from the Joint Commission, you know, strategy in really pertaining to health equity is is vital for organizations right now um, and very important. So, you know, um, so what so what would contribute to and, and how do we start to kind of think about developing that that health equity strategy or your social determinants of health strategy is really, you know, looking at ways that we can uh, expand our own internal data collection, um, maybe leveraging that data collection framework, uh, getting some, you know, developing kind of a uniform system for how we collect the data. Because, you know, as, you know, maybe your revenue cycle folks know that, you know, the, if we're not getting, you know, complete data sets at registration, um, we're going to have a hard time billing claims and collecting payment. Uh, so, you know, the, it's it's really in you know vital to to have that point of care data collection happen and and expand that. Um, maybe we're just um, uh, collecting race and ethnicity. Um, is there an opportunity to start collecting educational attainment or you know um, think about that? You know that's something a conversation to happen internally. Um, you know, examine that data, um, examine and stratify that quality and health outcome data, really to get that, uh, understand where there is that magnitude of health disparity um, for your uh, community and where there may be um, those, those gaps in care um, specific to a patient population or to an, an area within your, you know, a geographical area within your community. Um, Start to incorporate, and this you know goes back to involving leadership engagement and involving key stakeholders is um, having those conversations, presenting data and information um, for folks like your medical community or the board around um, health equity and outcomes data related to your your community and the, at the local level, um, you know and start to include that strategic planning, um, include that health equity data, social determinants of health data, uh, health, clinical outcomes data in your strategic planning and community health needs assessments. Um, start to explore different um, enhancements to support closing some of those care gaps. Um, whether that's, you know, uh, looking at care navigators or health coaches, um, maybe we've, you know, highlighted in our data that uh, you know, preventative cancer screenings are not being done in the black population. Uh, so, you know, can we make some investments to start to close some of those, those care gaps? Um, leveraging the technology um, to really start to improve care coordination and, and capturing of that vital information and data. Um, sharing uh, prevalence and cost data with, uh, you know, local payers, or, and then, and, you know, sharing that information about, you know, what is happening in the local level as it relates to care management and supporting, you know, other, um, our community members and, and kind of helping support closing those, those care gaps and, and creating a an, an more equitable um, healthcare system. And certainly, and, and we'll touch upon this in the next slide, is really collaborate with community organizations. It's not something that um, we should, you know, have to go about on our own. Um, collaboration is key to making and supporting some of our vulnerable populations within our community. Um, next slide. 
aqui. And as I said, you know, tackling health equity um, can certainly seem like you're climbing Mount Everest, um, but it really is important to realize the, the realm of possibilities and, and what one can have an influence on. And so if you're familiar with Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, it, he distinguished between proactive people um, and reactive people. The proactive people are focusing on what they can do and can influence, while the reactive people are focusing all their energy on things beyond their control. Um, and so you can see here from this um, graphic here, you know, you have a circle of influence. Um, these are the, the, for these, you know, the circle of influence tend to be um, the things that we can do something about. Um, and really what we want to do is we want to focus energy on those things that, um, and this will, you know, allow us to have some effective change. Um, our circle of concern is, is really those things that are outside of our circle of influence or outside of our influence. And if we do focus too much time and energy on them, um, it may, you know, not be successful and it could be a waste of time. Um, and so, you know, when we start to think about what we can influence as healthcare organizations, as a physician practice, as medical providers, or, you know, as a community, um, we really need to have, you know, start to look at a team. And because a team can have a wider circle of influence than just one individual. And, uh, and so really that's, you know, in order for us to start to um, really kind of tackle health equity as, as a an organization, it, it should be looking at like a team and um, within partnerships to really have that, that direct influence. Um, next slide. And um, lastly, you know, uh, you know, we've certainly, COVID has um, propelled us, I think, even further and really created more public awareness around um, racial and ethnic disparities. Um, and so there, it, you know, having, having these conversations, although they were vital before, before COVID, um, they are, you know, necessary and important and vital for organizations to have these conversations now. Um, and, and what, you know, hospitals and healthcare systems are really leading the charge um, and utilizing data as a, kind of the starting point. And it should be the starting point um, because, you know, a lot of, you know, it could be going around the hamster wheel if we just go out and try to tackle something that we don't have the necessarily necessary data to be able to support and make those tr tr strategic decision making. So, um, you know, key components um, that I would hope that we leave you with is the importance of, of leveraging data, um, measuring it, collecting it, um, looking at it and asking questions. Um, because, you know, if, if we don't ask questions, if we don't look at the data, um, you know, some of these disparities within our own communities may go unnoticed. And so, you know, in order for us to start to improve the healthcare um, and the uh, equitable care that is given within our organizations, um, you know, healthcare data needs to be needs to be looked at, um, and so so we can start to strategize and really start to allocate or reallocate uh, resources appropriately to help continue to support communities. So I hope I leave you with that. Um, that is it for our our webinar today, and I know that we have some time uh, to open up for questions, but. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thanks, Lindsay. I actually don't have any um, questions at all that have come through. So um, I did get one person who was interested in getting the slide deck. I'll make sure that you have their information. Other than that, I wanna thank you and our attendees for taking the time to join us today. Um, everyone will get a link to a recording. Feel free to share that with your team. Before I close out the webinar, is there anything else, Lindsay or Keith, that you'd like to leave with the audience? I found the information to be very, very useful myself. Uh, thanks, Colleen. Yeah, you know, I think in our, our concluding slide, and, and really it's, it's start small. I think that's the biggest key, key takeaway because, um, you know, 
looking at your own internal data is is a lot too. Um, and you know, start small, have some small wins, and be able to kind of start to support community community members um, in achieving you know their optimal health. Uh, and I think it's you'll you'll find it's very very rewarding. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, this is uh, this is kind of a it's a new initiative. It's a new approach. It's a good a good initiative, um, and it's you know it's going to be it's going to be refined as it goes on. Um, and uh, I think it's just the the awareness of uh, you know having people think about this in terms of uh, you know beyond just uh, clinical care is very very important. So, and I thank everyone for listening. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe and healthy. Bye bye.